Oh, well, thank you so much for joining all of us today. Um, I know everyone's probably a lot more excited to see you than they are to see me, uh, even though I am dressed as a candy cane, if you can't tell. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Maybe we could just start. I'm super interested. What made you first get into music in the first place? Oh, tough question. Um, I have really hippie parents. I grew up in like a real barefoot family. We would um, go to folk festivals and things really often. And my dad played guitar um, and played to us a lot. So I went to a Stein school, which is like an arts focused school. Um, and yeah, started playing string instruments really young and just like got well obsessed. And yeah. that's how it sort of began. And then I discovered synthesizers and everything changed. Um, and obviously you've gone on to take this kind of love for synthesizers and your passion and turn it into a real career. Was this always kind of what you thought would come out of this? No, I think you have to like, in order to enjoy playing music, you have to constantly like not see it as a career. Like I never, it's only been the last year that when people have asked me what I do, that I say that I'm a musician. I'm always just like, I don't know, I do like bits and bobs. So I feel like once you start expecting it to be like your job, it starts to be unenjoyable. So I, I like, I've never expected to be here and I don't expect to be able to keep this job. You know, I just really enjoy it while I'm doing it. That's awesome. Um, they say if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life or something like that. Exactly. So it's very good, very good advice to live by. So was there any point, I know you said that you don't really see it as a job, but was there any kind of point where you started taking steps towards, you know, maybe like working a little bit harder to market your music or um, putting a li little bit more thought, I guess, into the actual business side of things? Yes, yeah. So like when I released my second EP, um, that started getting some attention overseas and I was, I realized that like, you know, if I do want to do this for as long as I can, then it's going to take more than winging it. And I think that um, it's really important to talk about that stuff because I think especially in Melbourne and Australia, it's sort of seen as like unfashionable to like work really hard and try and to be like, oh, I actually really want this. Like people are always like, oh yeah, but like, you know, I just like, I fluked that album and I don't really care. I'm like, no, I try really hard. <laughs> I stumbled um, and fell into a record deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think like, no, it just takes a lot of hard work. And for me, that was going overseas. Um, and it was getting in the studio with other people, which was something I'd never really done um, before after my first EP. And that was really scary. But I think collaboration is, is really useful for like bettering yourself as a producer or a writer or a performer or whatever you want to do um so i went over to the states and just got in lots of studios you just got to never stop like i was talking to someone the other day about music and about like why some people make a career out of it some people don't and i don't think it has that much to do with like skill or talent i think it's luck or it's endurance like you either are like a one hit wonder or you're willing to just be in it the longest, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's sort of what I'm doing because I just could never do anything else because I love it too much. Yeah. And you mentioned that it was really scary getting in there and recording your first EP. What was so scary about it? Was it like putting your music out there for people to listen to? Was it the process? Was it maybe the people? So my first EP I did on my own and I loved doing that. It was just like me and my friend Oscar who produced it with me. And then I went overseas to start writing and I'd just never been in the studio with anyone else. That was the scariest bit. Like, you know, you're getting in the studio with these like big producers and like, you know, like back then I didn't even know that there was such a thing as like being just a writer. Like you go in and like just write the lyrics or you just write the hook. You know, and I would go into these rooms of like five or six people and just be like, what is going on? It was terrifying and you just got to learn to fake it. Yeah. I still get really nervous and I just, I just fake confidence in, in the studio. I think that's the thing about a lot of creative industries. You kind of feel like you have to walk into somewhere, especially someone who's starting out and either know everything or 
like you know you're not valid in those spaces or maybe it's like super scary but I don't know I think maybe it's a part of obviously you're a little bit further down your career now that you can look back at those kind of experiences and feel like you've really learned something from them yeah the one thing as long as you're like willing to try everything as long as you're willing to jump in then you're going to be okay and that's kind of that's like the only thing um I, I know that I'm good at, you know, I think I have a lot of insecurities, but one thing I know that I'm good at is I'll generally try anything and I'm okay to embarrass myself. Um, cause I do anyway, I like fall over like three times a day. So I may as well just get in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's changed for you in terms of how you make music and how you would go into those spaces now, um, as the person that you are versus as the person you were back then? The biggest thing that's changed is that I've got a real confidence in my ability now. I used to, like I've always produced, but I've never felt comfortable getting in the chair. I've never felt comfortable like doing it myself because I have a very specific type of production. Like I have a very specific style and it's messy. Like I'm a messy producer. And if anyone else looked at my stems or my sessions, they would just, it's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare because I never went to school. Like. I really wish I went to call arts. I didn't want to ask anyone for help, especially at the time it was like mainly men producing and I didn't want to ask any men for help. So I just did a bunch of YouTube tutorials and like would like take notes next to the producer I was working with and just be like watching them. Um, so I've always been terrified. And I think over the last couple of years that's changed because I've just had some really important people in my life who like validated what I do in a way that has made me listen, which, you know, I think is important to have people you respect and give you honest feedback so that when you continue to work and get good at something, you believe them when they tell you that you've improved, you know. And I know that a lot of people listening today are, um, I guess, on that journey to doing all the great things that you're doing and I, I guess most of them are doing them right now if you could offer one piece of advice what would it be I just wouldn't worry about what A&Rs tell you because they're going to tell you a lot you're going to meet people who are going to tell you you need to sound like someone else or, or you know your records should be poppier or they know what Triple J is going to love or whatever no one knows like you know I've had songs that I've been, people have been like, this is the hit, this is going to be the one. And it's the weirdest track on the record that everyone loves. And I think that like, the only reason anyone succeeds is because they, they're like the best version of themselves. And that sounds like really obvious advice, but it's really easy to forget. It's yeah. really, really easy to forget when you see people doing really well and you think, oh, how I want to learn how to do it that way or whatever so I think the best thing to remember is like the whole reason you're interesting is because you're not really like anyone else yeah awesome um and then at call arts for a bit of a closing question we've been talking a lot about um the phrase it's a dream till it's not so being able to kind of picture this amazing thing in your mind and then making it a reality do you think that's possible yeah totally possible the wild thing is is you have to remember that it was a dream of yours because by the time you make it to there it seems really normal and you're not appreciating it you know yeah. it's totally possible that's what's so exciting about the world you know like even COVID like I was saying the other day like COVID is such a good example of like you never know what's around the corner and you can either like see that in a really negative way or you can be like if they can make it I can make it who the hell knows I wouldn't have predicted half of the people who, who were killing it on the radio. And they all are. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Now, everyone is asking lots of questions in the chat. So I'm going to read some out. Uh, okay. So I've got a question from Jesse. How did you go about finding your sound in the face of those A&R types? It was hard. I actually wrote a song about it, Body Suit, um, which was on my second EP, is about that experience of just like, faking it, like trying to impress these people. It's really hard. I think um, the A&R types that I've met, 
you know, they don't really like me <laughs> because I don't, um, I don't make the music they want me to make. And when I try to, it's bad. Like when I try and be someone else, it's really bad. Like I've tried before, it's not a good idea. So it is, yeah, it's, it's hard and it's an ongoing challenge, you know, I have people constantly giving me their opinions about what my next move should be. Um, and you just have to sort of like stay focused and, and work out what you want from it. But yeah, I think my own sound is, is difficult because it changes a lot. Yeah. I'm committed to genre, which is something I'm um, very often told off for, but I continue to just play with genre because it's more fun. Yeah, well, that's it. Like you're talking about how the world changes so much and opinions change and life changes. It's like impossible surely to keep the same sound as you, I guess, go through all of that. So we've got a message from Kitling. What's your favorite collaboration to date? I think my favorite collab, having Sophie on right, which is a song off my last record. Um, that's just really special to me because she was like, actually one of the first people I collaborated with and one of my best friends and I think it's really nice to like have her on my record and be able to feel like I'm singing with her so that I like having her on um on the record I like Ripe and she she produced um Count On You with me too so they're, they're two of my favorite collabs we've got uh, if you could change your sound what would you change it to and would you change it at all that's such an evil question because <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Oh my God, here's the thing, is I think that like, I'd love to tell you that like, of course I wouldn't because I'm so like grown and I've learned all these lessons and I love my sound and like whatever. But like, yeah, of course, like I have so much self doubt. Like every time I hear someone on the radio, I'm like, damn it, I wish I sounded like that. So I'm sure I, I would if I could, but like the thing is, is that's a flawed question because if you could only change it once, then you'd just, you'd be doing this all over again. Um, I'd get sick of the new sound that I had. I think that if there was something I could do to change my sound, it would be that I'd really like to improve my vocal ability. And that's something that I have been saying for years and I've even had friends like offer to give me singing lessons and you know, like Laura Lee, who's Empress of, who sings on um, my record, she started for like eight years and she was like, I'll give you singing lessons every week. Just never did them. <laughs> Lots of time, don't worry. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. This is from Isabella that says, I'm wondering how you write music to and what inspires you to write? I'm quite, an emotional person. I, I feel the highs really high, I feel the lows really low. Um, I think a lot of creatives do. Um, I feel like, you know, everyone I know in the music industry has struggled with their own mental health issues and it's actually really cool. I think that it actually has really helped me to write, to have struggled a lot with my mental health and to have that as something that I like have music or something I can go to in those times. So I'd say that that actually inspires me to write because I feel like for a long time in my life, I was always really shy about mental health and was like sort of pissed off about the fact that um, I get depressed or feels thing, feel things a lot. Um, and I was like, actually, it's kind of awesome because that's what makes me write and sort of makes me creative. So I guess mm -hmm. that's it. When I get really emo. Well, it also helps when you're surrounded by a bunch of people who also feel that way. So it's yeah. what I think is so nice about being in a community like Call Arts is, you know, you're never kind of alone in something like that. And it sounds cheesy, but I don't know. I think it's true. It speaks yeah. to a lot of people. Cool. Well, I hate to cut you short, but I would love to see you perform. So I'm going to get off. <laughs>